Hi, Hi Nancy. Hi, Grace. How are you? Good. Welcome. Well and then I met Nancy separately, I think, at an yes. APD event or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Which is yeah. so funny. And then we realized the joint connection, Sarah, right. which was yeah. fun. Right. Um, but yeah, no. And then, you know, we just have been in our own little world. And it was so lovely when you guys reconnected. I know I was so excited to hear from you. I knew you were working yeah. on the book. So this is going to be so much fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's just, I think there's so much natural um, synergy. So we were really excited that you were able to do it. Yeah, that's so fun. I'm really excited to hear more about it. I've been reading the book and <laughs> so good, so useful. Yeah. Well, that was, that was the design point, right? <laughs> yes. Well, and it's a fun read, isn't it, Grace? It is. I it really know. is. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed it too. Um, so how are you, are you guys getting a lot of traffic in the bookstore or have you seen that big shift, obviously? Um, we weren't initially, so we had to really transition to a lot of e-commerce things and, but we've had people trickle in and we've been open 12 to four to the public every day. Oh, really? Um, then we had independent bookstore day recently on yep. Saturday and that was just, it was such a great outpouring of support from the community and so many people stopped by and. So it kind of gave us like, it felt like before times, you know, but obviously with yeah. social distancing and everything, um, we're just trying to make sure that we keep things um, limited right now. But um, we've had several textbook rush, uh, back to school rushes since the pandemic started and those went well too. Great. So we're able to, we just came up with like systems and we have a big enough store where we're able to distance and, you know, right. let line people out in the parking lot, that kind of thing. Yeah. So we're lucky that way. Mm -hmm. yep. And right, I, Grace. okay. Oh, I go see ahead and get things started. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Grace and I'm the events producer at University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington. Let us know where you're zooming in from in the chat because we would love to see. University Bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in the region. In fact, we're celebrating our 121st anniversary this year. Tonight, we're proud to partner with the Microsoft Alumni Network to present the third event in our new speaker series featuring leadership and business titles written by former Microsoft staff and published by HarperCollins Leadership. The Microsoft Alumni Network is a worldwide community of alumni who share a common experience of having worked at Microsoft. Founded in 1995 by a few alumni who wanted to stay connected, the Alumni Network today is a member organization representing more than 48,000 alumni in 54 countries. I'd like to welcome you all to our event with authors Nancy McSherry Jensen and Sarah Dunwald, who are here to tell us more about their new book, Back to Business, Finding Your Confidence, Embracing Your Skills, and Landing Your Dream Job After a Career Pause. They will be in conversation with Elaine M. Knudsen of UW's Foster School of Business. Nancy has launched businesses for IDG and Microsoft, served as an instructor at UW, and currently serves as CEO and co-founder of The Swing Shift. She's been featured in Forbes, The Huffington Post, at Seattle's infamous F-Bomb Breakfast Club, which sounds really fun, and the, family, the Female Founders Alliance Champion Awards. The award-winning Swing Shift was a semi-finalist at Social Venture Partners Fast Pitch Competition and a finalist for Seattle Chamber's Women in Business Leadership Awards. Sarah's career over the past 15 years is focused on revenue growth operations in the technology consulting industry. She has won multiple presidents clubs and various awards for revenue achievement and client growth. After the birth of her second child, she took a brief career pause and went on to meet Nancy and together they founded the Swing Shift to pursue their passion for helping women in career transition. Moderating today's discussion is Elaine Knudsen, Senior Associate Director of MBA Career Management at the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington. Elaine has provided career coaching to foster MBA students since 2014, and when she has extra time, champions coaching and talent strategies for the broader Seattle-based business community. She brings 15 plus years of corporate experience in global talent acquisition, leadership development, and university programs to her practice. Her pre-foster career included leadership roles in prominent tech, nonprofit, and financial services companies. And in addition to her prior HR experience, Elaine is a Gallup certified strengths-based coach. 
and holds a master's coach certification from the Behavioral Coaching Institute. You guys, what an impressive <laughs> bio for all of you. Um, now, so before we get started, um, if you have any questions for our authors or moderator, please put them in the Q&A field um, at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Feel free to chat with each other and our moderators and author, uh, authors using your chat. And so I am now gonna hand it over to Elaine, Nancy, and Sarah. Thank you so much, Great. We appreciate it. And boy, you're making my job easy. I don't even have to do intro, ladies. <laughs> So we are so excited to be here. And one point I wanna add, just in case, I don't know if I heard it in there, um, I'd like to congratulate you both. You can add author to your list of accomplishments, which was already pretty large. And I will also add, I know, you know, Nancy and Sarah are both active members and their communities as well. So we appreciate that. And I'm so excited to host this conversation. So. I kind of want to start by saying, um, in addition to the congratulations, I, I just want to say that I absolutely loved reading the book. There were moments that I laughed out loud. There were other moments where I, you know, flagged the page and took out a highlighter. And, you know, Grace kind of took my thunder and saying already what my background is. But I think it's important to share because, you know, I've been doing this coaching stuff for a long time. And I'm also an ex-recruiter, right? So I felt like, I know this space. I'm just going to read the book and see how they did it. But I really loved the way you, you know, you brought in fun, as I said, and you just embedded it with so much great advice. So congratulations. And, you know, giving that intro, I'd love to just get this conversation started. So I guess my first question is you started the swing shift in 2017, right? Early. That's I imagine right. there was some concept happening before that right. <laughs> as, as with any startup, but what prompted you to write the book back to business, you know, at that point? Yeah. So I'll take this and thank you so much. Uh, you and Grace for the kind words. Um, we, when we started our business, we ran in-person programming. So we have a flagship program called the Career Catalyst, and we would run it twice a year for about eight weeks. And um, we would bring in women who had taken breaks or wanted to do something different. And we would, we started with the idea of discernment. And then through the eight week period, um, we would go through everything, including LinkedIn, resume, branding, social, end up with interview and negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, we expanded to, you know, half day and corporate workshops and one-on-one -on -one consulting. Um, but the, the lessons from their, our flagship pro program were the things that people kept coming back to. And, uh, you know, and I'm the Microsoft alum. So that's how we got in with the alumni network. They called about a year and a half ago and said, Hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? And we said, funny, you should ask. Right. Because we, we, and Sarah, you should jump in here too. But I think we felt that we were so fortunate to be able to share, you know, the learning because it's not just us. We bring in experts from of course. Know, industry, right? Um, but we really <laughs> wanted to make the lessons that we were learning um, as, along with the folks that we worked with out to a much broader audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really the genesis of it. And, you know, and it, we were, we, we had been approached by a couple of other publishers, but then uh, Harper Collins came and talked with us and it was being prepared and being in the right place at the right time. Right, right. 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 Yeah, no, that makes sense. One thing that stood out to me as I read the book, um, it, it was, I think, the way that you structured it. So I'd love to ask about that, but let me preface it for, for a little bit so you know why it stood out to me. So I think that most people will think, okay, I've, I've taken this career pause. I love that term, by the way. I will forever say career pause. Right. Um, but, but you know, I, I need to return to work. Time to dust off my resume. And, and they're just thinking so narrowly about the process. But leading with reflection and, and some of those other elements are so critical. So maybe, Sarah, you could lead, start with this one. H can you explain to the audience how, you know, you structured the book or how you both decided that and, and why? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is really structured around how Nancy mentioned our career catalyst prior. Like we knew that the the program worked the way it was implemented and it was really deliberate. It was starting with reflection first, 
mm-hmm. then working with your job search toolkit, and then interviews and negotiations and everything built off of each other. Mm-hmm. And for example, you know, you can't customize your resume if you haven't thought about what is it? What are my skills? What do I bring to the table? What do I want to do next? You know, what are those roles out there? And so that's really important to think about that stuff. You know, another example is, you know, you can't get out there and network if you haven't thought about how are you going to talk about yourself? Right. And all, right. You know, your skills and your experience that you bring to the table. So mm-hmm. really the, the, um, the way the book is structured again is, is for a reason um, because that process works. And so we wanted to make sure that we were really illustrating that um, throughout the book. And the other part is, you know, we also lead off with stories, Elaine, as you mentioned, because we wanted it to also be very hopeful. You know, we have a lot of women, hundreds of women that we've worked with that just have felt hopeless, you know, very isolated, whether professionally, personally, um, and just knowing that, you know what, these are real women, just like you, right. hundreds that have had success working mm-hmm. this program and you, as you can do it as well, you know, and that's really what we wanted the tone of the book to be about is it's very action oriented, first step, second step, third step, but infusing that, like, this is hopeful, you know, be, be very positive about this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Anything you would add, Nancy? And I, I definitely, I had a thought as she was sharing that, as well that, you know, that's really where a lot of the overlap exists. Because remember the population that we work with at the Foster School of Business in the MBA space, you know, my role now focuses on folks that are in a full-time program. So they have left, right, the workforce. And I think understanding how the job search process works um, is, is just so critical. But I love that you started with sharing Um, stories of success, because I think believing you're going to be successful and building up confidence is so, so important. Um, And and maybe, uh, you know, there's that element. The other question I wanted to make sure that we addressed was what is the biggest challenge? (laughs) No, it's one challenge, but what's the biggest challenge you think people face when they go to return to work? I, I, I'll, I'll start and then Sarah can jump in. Okay. Um, I think that the biggest, the biggest challenge from our experience that people face is that they, they get caught, as you mentioned at the top, they get caught in the weeds of, oh, I've got to get my resume perfect, (laughs) right? Rather than saying, okay, what is it that I want to do? And then who can I go talk to about that? who's either doing that job or might be in a position down the line Mm -hmm. to help me get into that role. And so I think it's really easy to focus on the tangibles, Mm -hmm. right? And it's a lot harder, but ultimately more productive to take a step back and be a little more thoughtful. Sarah, what would you say? Do you, do you agree with that? I would agree with you. I, you know, it's definitely um, the the network and not just any network, right? We all have our networks, whether past professional network, our personal network, um, but it's how do you work your network in a way and be very deliberate about right. it? And there's tools out there that can help you do that. And then the other piece of the network is people might say, you know, I don't have much of a network. Maybe they're new to the city or town and they don't, they actually do not know anyone. Um, you know, there are, you know, there's a, there's a strategy around where to go to network and where you're going, who are the types of people that you want to talk to? And we outline all of that in the book because we're all about, you know, productivity, like getting the most out of our time, right. energy. Yeah. Everyone's right. busy, we have a lot on our plate and you yeah. don't need to keep showing up at random events for the sake of it. You know, there's, mm-hmm. there's a strategy around all of that, but networking is definitely can be one of the biggest barriers. Right. Um, what, I just caught something you said there and that time, <laughs> sense of urgency and time is just such a precious commodity. When you think about the population you're really speaking to, um, one of the things that I loved about the book was just this very clear, succinct, so, you know, the process makes sense, the, the structure makes sense, but then at the back, the templates, the examples, um, okay. you know, how do you coach people around that balance? between using the script, but then making it, making it their own, right? We, we, right. we talk a lot about that as well. Could either of you address that? Yeah, I can take this one. It's just about practicing. It's right. about practicing it out loud. Yeah. You know, 
the script is just a place to start because that's a lot of times what is the biggest hurdle is where to start. So we literally just have you fill in the blanks just to start. Right. And then you just start saying it over and over. You say it in the mirror, you say it to your partner, um, you practice, you record yourself and it will change depending on who you're talking to, but th there will be um, you know, a foundation that you will use in all parts of your networking. And that will, if you practice, you'll feel confident and you'll be able to talk about that in any situation. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, great. Um, anything else, Nancy, on that? Or should we keep going? Yeah, no, let's get, that's okay. about right. Okay, great. Um, well, let's, I, I guess I had one other question. I just wanted to highlight uh, one thing I love from the book was this idea, and I think you addressed it now, but I want to be more direct about it, okay. that the resume just has to be good enough. Now, this may be blowing some coaches' minds, okay, but mm -hmm. I just said it. Because at the end of the day, what I'm hearing from you, and this is something we talk a lot about too, is the network is, is so important there. Have you seen people struggle and spend a lot of time maybe in that other area of getting in the weeds on their tools? Uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts about that? What did you Absolutely. mean by it just has to be good enough in that chapter? So I, and I'll, I'll take this one and then Sarah can jump in. Absolutely. I, I would say 90% of the people that we work with, they, one of the first things they talk about is, well, I haven't updated my resume in 15 years. Right. Um, and then they get very, very focused on their resume and what goes on there. And, you know, we've had people say, well, I can't possibly get it down shorter than four pages. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, as we, we do a lot of work with recruiters and with folks in the industry. And, you know, one of the things that we've learned in talking with them is that recruiters, when they look at the resume at all, only look at it for about six seconds. That's not very long. Um, and so it just has, it's got to have enough information on there to catch their eye and say, oh, this person might be an interesting match for role X. But more likely, the recruiter isn't looking at your resume at all. The recruiter is Googling you. Right. The recruiter is looking at LinkedIn. The recruiter is maybe seeing what you've got up on Instagram or maybe Facebook, you know. And so what we're saying is, yes, certainly you need a resume. But just and maybe even more important is what does your social footprint look like? Sarah, what would you add? Yeah, I, I would you know, the resume is important, but I can't say it's more important than any of the other tools in your job search toolkit, your pitch, your LinkedIn, your network. Right. They're all pretty equally weighted and they're used differently depending on what you're doing, right? Um, you know, really with the resume, I would just say a, a key thing is to make sure that it's just relevant, right? Yep. Certain things that have changed. You don't use your address. You don't put your address anymore. You you know, if you have a Yahoo email, perhaps maybe get a Gmail. You know, there's things like that, that very simple, simple fixes. We actually have a free download on our um, book website that runs through this stuff, but it's, it's not anything that's going to take you hours and hours, right? It's just a simple refresh. And really all that is, is during that six seconds, you don't want to them to think, oh, this person's not relevant. You're just showing them that you know what's going on, right? And so that's, that's really what the resume is. Right. Yeah. And if it's not four pages, what should it be? What are you telling people? Two, two. Yeah, you know, the yeah. two pages is two pages max. You know, I had somebody tell me that they couldn't get it down to two. And I said, well, I know several CEOs in the area who have one page resumes and if yeah. they can do it, you can do it, you know, but it's hard. It's hard to it's hard. edit it down. Yeah. yeah. No, I hear you. Um, today, earlier this, this morning, the reason why this is fresh and we can certainly move on is I did a webinar on resumes for our incoming MBAs mm -hmm. and we're one page. Let me be clear in the tier one, like top programs, it's all one page. Yep. Right? That's so right. I hear you on that. Yep. Let's, Pivot a little bit, you know, I think this is along the same lines. What advice would you have for people who are switching roles or, you know, industry? Some of the strategies maybe you've already talked about, do they change? Like, how do you think about the true career transition? Right. And this is something that I think a lot of people, you know, whether you've taken a pause or if you're an MBA student and you've, you know, you've committed yourself fully to your education, 
right. you're doing this with an eye towards moving up or over to a new role. Right. I think one of the things we, we recommend to people is that you, you have to think about what is it that you are bringing to the party? So if you are looking to change, you wanna change industry and role. Mm-hmm. Well, you've gotta take first one step, either doing the thing that you know how to do in a different industry or do, you know, do something new in the same industry that you certainly, that you work in now, right? You've always got to have one foot, Colleen O'Brien at M12 Ventures talks about this. You've always got to have one foot in something that you know, and then one foot in something that you're learning. Because for many people, when they're looking for a job, they think about it from their perspective. Well, I've got my resume and my pitch, and what am I going to do? And you really have to turn that around and think, what are these prospective hiring managers and recruiters looking for? Yeah. And yeah. what they're looking for is, you know, in you, they want to see, well, how could I put this person to work in the jobs that I currently have? Mm-hmm. So and when he- you're looking to switch, you've got to think, okay, if I'm going to switch, what am I bringing that's transferable? Right, right. Sure. And, and going back to that, because I, I think you're talking a little bit about path, right? So, yes. and, and correct me, I hope, boy, I hope I get this right. That's yeah. kind of, you're making the analogy of the lily. Is that the lily? Oh, yeah. 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 So can you talk a little bit about those, or either one of you, about the four yeah. paths back, typically for people who've made a, a pause? Yeah. Yeah. Nancy, Sarah, okay. why don't you start? Okay. So we've, through, you know, our work in the past few years and hundreds of women that we've watched go through this program and and who's been successful and who's struggled a little bit more, it all really boils down to four paths back are really the the best route back. Um, And that's the boomerang, Mm -hmm. the try and buy, the lily pad, and the pro bono to paid approach. Mm -hmm. And we'll just go through really quick, you know, the boomerang is, is what, what it sounds like is going back to a company that you've worked for previously or a manager that you've worked for previously. This is sometimes a lower barrier to entry. Um, you know, it's, you know, even if you didn't have a, a, an amazing experience, maybe it was a while ago, we do encourage you to check in on that um, job and that manager and touch base and just kind of feel it out and see if that's an option. And all of these options that we talk about, I like to preface is these, these aren't the dream jobs, right? That right. you're doing first, you know, these are what's going to make it easier to get that dream job, right? Because there's, you know, you can be looking for a job for years. Mm-hmm. And that's not a joke, right? Or right. you can get a job faster, network, get paid all at the same time, right. need more skills, experience, right? learn something new, you know, and then you can pivot and you're having a different conversation. You're not having a conversation about your break. You're having a conversation about your recent work experience, right? right? So the boomerang is one path. And then we have um, the try and buy, which is really popular for testing out. If you're going to, Elaine, like we talked about a career change or a career pivot, right? And this is really with like contract freelance work. There's a ton of outstanding contract agencies um, in these cities that work with the top companies out there and their project-based work. There's usually a start and stop date. You know, you can figure out if this is right for you. And in that time, you're maybe gaining a new skill or at least you're networking within that company. But one thing we like to say about the try and buy is make sure that it's a limited duration, right? You don't want to, unless you enjoy that type of work, you don't want to stay there forever. All of these are very, um, make sure you have a, a start and an end They're date. time bound. Yeah. Or at just, least you've, you've thought of that for yourself. Like, what are my boundaries? What absolutely. are my limits? Exactly. It's easy to get lost in the day-to-day too, probably, right? Is that what yeah. you mean? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. We want to make sure that this is part of your strategy, not your, you know, return, right? Right. It's a, it's a longer journey, right? Than that initial job back. Mm-hmm. And then Nancy, I don't know if you want to go through Sure. The- yeah. The third approach that we talk about is the lily pad. And this is particularly effective for people who maybe have been out for a little while mm-hmm. um, or maybe who uh, feel they don't have the requisite um, oomph to go in and get back to the job they used to have. What we say in those cases is take a job that utilizes a set of your skills. Mm-hmm. So let's say that in the past you were the director of marketing and so you oversaw all elements of a marketing campaign. Well, maybe there's a job that's open um, that uses two of your four key skill sets and someone will hire you to do those things. Well, 
on one hand, you, you could say, well, I don't want to do that because um, it's not using my, all of my skills. And on the other hand, especially if you've been out for a little while, we, we suggest taking that job, doing it, doing it extraordinarily well. Mm-hmm. And while you're doing that, as Sarah mentioned, you're getting paid you're right. making new contacts, right. um, you're getting career progression. And then after six, nine, 12 months, you can then leap to the next job that really does use the breadth of your skills. And there's, we think that there's a lot of benefits to this approach. Some, mm-hmm. some people resist it, I'll, I'll be honest with you, because they feel like, well, maybe it's taking a step back. And we think that, you know, honest paid work is good work. And as Sarah mentioned, it shifts your conversation. You no longer are talking about or thinking about, well, I was on break. I was taking care of my kids or my parents or whatever it was. You're talking about, I took this job and now I'm going to go do use these skills plus my other skills and do them for you. The final path is this pro bono to paid. Um, And this is, this is particularly effective in the not, not for profit in the uh, social impact area. Um, and we see a lot of women that we work with um, ha- do um, volunteer work, and that is pro bono consulting. Mm-hmm. And so if there's a job or an industry or a company that you're interested in breaking into, mm-hmm. um, we do suggest being very deliberate and doing a pro bono engagement with them as a way to build your network, um, to make um, contact with other people and other companies in the industry, to get some work experience on your resume. We also recommend you do this for a very short mm-hmm. amount of time. It's very effective when it's used strategically. We, we have a ton of people who have done this. And what they do is they do these, they do, they do these roles for industry associations or for nonprofits. Mm-hmm. And they, they really network like crazy with the board and with the staff and they have a pitch and they say, I'm, use, I'm doing this and I'd like to get a job doing that. So um, it's, it's a way to get yourself back in. Um, and the, the people we work with really fall into one of those four buckets. Got it. And, and just to real quick, sorry, oh, Elaine. Go ahead, Sarah. I always think this is an important um, piece to think about on the pro bono to paid approach. So a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of uh, moms out there that are working within their schools. Yes. They are, you know, type A's and they're doing a lot of stuff, but a lot of times they're doing the things that maybe nobody else will do, right? Some of the grunt work because they're trying to pick up the pieces. We want you to try to step back from that and be more, a little bit more deliberate and proactive about the type of work you're taking on. Is this something that I can talk about in a professional way? You know, if like, what do I want to do next? Is there a job within this community that I can take on that can help me get skills in that area? Really focus on that. And that's a way of not only, you know, making sure that you're giving your time to organizations that you you know, you want to, you know, right. help, but right. you're also helping yourself, right? Well, yeah. it, you, your point is that you're getting the experience you need to make that. Tra- That's right. The word transition, we think about it, it's like not one fell swoop. There's so many little pieces in there. And I think this is relevant advice for MBAs for anyone, honestly, because we all make changes. I mean, I, we, we've all been through it and this certainly <laughs> this panel, um, but you took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you so much, Sarah. Cause I was, I just was wanting to clarify between, well, I already am, you know, volunteering. This is, this is doing it something differently. This is doing it with a plan, with a purpose. Um, and then being able to articulate the why, right? Um, so this is, this is what I'm doing and this, here's how it's transitioning me. Got it. That's great. Um, I, you know, this is just so top of mind right now. We've had a year, right? It's been such a complicated and challenging and, um, just, a, 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 a year of change is really the way I've thought about it, even for myself. And I want to just address that because what's interesting to me is you all started this conversation way before COVID, you know, way before 5 million. And I'm sorry, I don't have the most accurate number, but it's like how many caregivers have left the workforce. So this is so top of mind right now. Um, And I think the question I want to start with there, and I, and I'd love to 
you know, get our audience involved too is, um, what, like, what advice do you have for your population who kind of already started this process, right? And how do you think about, um, I hate to use the word, the competition that's coming, right? When people start returning to work and this will all marry together. I mean, I think, imagine there's some positive elements, but you know, how do you talk about that with your base? Maybe we could start there. Sure. Um, when, you know, when we talk in the before times, um, <laughs> when we would talk to people about, you know, if they've taken a pause and they're getting ready to come back, what we suggest to them is that they talk about the things that they can do for their prospective employer or the things that they want to do next, right? Um, and so rather than um, focusing on, well, I was home or I took care of my kids or I took care of my parents, what we say is, okay, say, yep, I took a five-year break and now I want to go back to being a marketing program manager or I would like to um, investigate roles in biotech. I, I, tell them what you want to do next, right? right? So that's the first thing. I think one of the benefits, um, if you will, of this, this time in the pandemic is that so many people have unexpectedly stepped back from work. And so I think there is a grace period where people can say, yes, I did take a break and it was extended because of COVID. And now I'm looking to do whatever it is. It, that won't last forever. Um, I do think that there is um, an increased awareness of what is happening at home mm -hmm. with with caregivers because people who are running companies are seeing it firsthand all day, every day. They see it happening underfoot and they understand to a much deeper degree, you know, why, why people go home to take care of their, their parents and their kids and themselves. Sarah, what would you add to that? Yeah. First, I'd just like to get the number out there that before the pandemic, 46% of women took a career break. Right. That's almost half of the workforce. So it was always a very big problem. Um, this is definitely shedding more light on it, which is right. good. Um, and I agree with Nancy, you know, I guess, um, uh, I hate to use the silver lining of all of this is that lots of people have breaks now, right? So, right. Hopefully that's, you know, taking that stigma away from it, mm -hmm. um, but on the flip side, it makes for a very chaotic job market, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of candidates out there. So how do you think about differentiating yourself? And that's where, you know, I keep referring to this, you know, job search toolkit. That's why all these other pieces are so important. It's your right. profile, it's your personal brand, yeah. making sure that this is up to date. It's that you're networking efficiently. You know, that is what's going to make you stand out when you're getting back into the workforce, right. and especially during this time. And you both uh, touch on this in different ways. And Nancy, you might've been more specific and, you know, I'd love to really call it out before I see we have a question. We'll get right to that. Um, what, you know, how do you tell people to talk about their break? You know, I didn't ask that specific because right. that's something that I know I get a lot of questions about. Right. Um, you know, what are I, we were always taught, you know, you don't ask about someone's personal life as a recruiter, you know, from a right. legal perspective, don't ask sure. about family things in those early days. And so, um, yeah, how, how do care, people who are returning talk about that gap? To some extent, it depends on the length of time. You know, under two years, we found for the most part, and I'm, I'm sure you recall this from recruiting days, mm -hmm. under two years, people tend to not care. They say, oh, you worked there, you left, maybe I you're. Guess. You're taking a breather and now it's time to come back. Yep. Five years, you know, they generally, they figure, oh, you've started a family, right? Over 10 years, th there are bigger questions about, well, why did you step back for so long? Right. And it kind of doesn't matter what it was you were doing because what you want is a succinct story. This is where we talk about having a clean pitch mm -hmm. and whatever it was you were doing, Right. We have a gal that worked that she was out for 18 years. And when wow. she went back, she mm -hmm. said, I had a son with special needs and I stayed home to get to take care of him and get him into college. Right. Now that he's at school, I'm ready to go back to work as a program manager. Mm -hmm. And she nailed a fabulous job. It took her a while. Right. right. She had to get right. she like many MBA um, candidates. Mm -hmm. She had to get additional education to get herself there. She is happy as a clam. But that's a super crisp pitch. Yeah. I took time off to take care of my kid. Yep. And now I'm looking to get back. Okay, Fine. that's it. 
So you're saying just address it, move on. Anything That's right. you would add to that, Sarah? Yeah, um, I think it's really important that you're a hundred percent unapologetic about it. Right. You took yeah. that time for a reason yeah. and own it. Mm -hmm. And that's all there is to it, right? And at the right. end of the day, like Nancy said, they don't really care. They just want you to account for your time, really, is yep. what they're looking for you to say, like, yeah, this is what I did. And they're like, oh, okay, that's what I thought, but just confirming, right. you know. So it's really about accounting for your time. The longer you are out, I think the more important it is to potentially um, characterize some volunteer experience that you've done, or you know, it can be even like a you know, large scale remodel that you right. manage. Or, you know, there's many different things. A lot of people are like, well, I haven't done anything. And then they go through like yeah. what they do on a daily basis. And there's lots of things, you know, outside of their home that they're doing. So, you know, that's again, another, you know, thing to think about. Um, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and you probably both feel this way, but you only get so much time to convince someone, right? That's right. So, so, you know, isn't it more compelling to spend that precious, just like your precious real estate on your one page. That's right. <laughs> that precious time, you know, articulating your skills and how you think you can add value or how you connect to the mission or the That's organization, right. right? So that makes a lot of sense. Let's get to the, one of our questions, um, if that's okay, since that's that right. came through. Um, and you, can you guys see the question as well? Or let yeah. me just read it out loud in, in case um, the audience can't all view it. So Monica's asking about, you know, your volunteering works. We were just talking about that and the resume. You know, are there certain types that you should or shouldn't be listed as pro bono? I think that's a really interesting question. Did you guys both uh, view that one? I'll give you a second. Yeah, I, I yes, I just saw it. Okay. List yourself as a consultant. Yeah. You, you, are, you are lending your skills and, ser and services to mm -hmm. an organization. Um, it, increasingly, um, companies are not able to ask you, well, how much did you get paid to do X or Y? Mm -hmm. um, and what, what, you do, what you wanna do is say, yes, I was a consultant and I worked for client X, client Y, client mm -hmm. Z, right? And then you quantify the work that you did for them. And, you know, you are the only person who knows, right, how much or little you got paid to do that work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that piece isn't as relevant, right? Not so really. it's good to try to like address, you know, or just like move on. Yes. Yeah. Let me yeah. tell you about the projects. Is that, okay, yep. got it. Yeah. The only, I, I agree with Nancy 100%. I do know. Um, there are some people out there that just can't wrap their minds Mind around, around that. that. And it's very important that you can, because you have to talk about it, right? right. So if you can't, you can say, well, I worked with this organization. Maybe there's a, you know, title that they gave you, you put that title. Maybe you do say volunteer, but again, list out what you've done. Make sure that you have results in there. You know, the impact that you made to that organization. All of that is so relevant and important. And again, it's, you want to be comfortable, right? And authentic, but you also should know that you are lending your services for free and they're getting a lot from that. So, right. right. Yeah. And, and to just to clarify, Monica, too, and feel free to, to chime in again if I'm capturing this wrong, but I think there is, though, and I'd love your thoughts on this, the, the differentiator, though, it's like showing up to volunteer and just like checking boxes is obviously very different. So that's right. So, you know, if you have the chance to kind of do substantive, you know, something that's really moving the mission forward, if you think about the goal and you can speak to how your work is right, then that's more what you're saying. You can yes. be confident to call really that. Great point. Right? Yeah. Yes. But if you showed up, you know, once a year to pick up trash on the beach or something, right. Right, that's not what we're going to put as work experience, right? Yeah. Obviously, you know, using some common sense, like how much time and effort did you spend towards this organization, you know, is, is something that, um, is, is important. Yes. That's a really good, um, point, Elaine. Yeah. Um, one more question. And I think Jean is addressing this, but I actually had it for someone who, um, had sent in a question beforehand and what that is. And, and you've addressed this though, as we talk about how to, um, 
uh, how to differentiate our pause you know, between someone who took that 10 year versus the 18 year. I, I think we wanna revisit that um, because I had a question here actually, just, just revisiting that, you know, um, do you recommend being more proactive about it? I guess is, is, is the idea. She's talking about, um, sorry, I just wanna talk about, or she's thanking us. Yeah, give us our best advice, perfect. But I did have someone actually as a colleague of mine who couldn't make it in, but she yeah. was really curious because what she talked about is it's one thing to talk about an interview, which it feels yes. kind of like we're simulating a little bit and maybe more formal networking, but what about more informally? You know, what are some channels or ways to talk about it? Again, be proud of it, but not over embellish the time. You know, any other tips to add there? You know, Abs the absolutely. And I'm going to use the, the 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 volunteer work as a jumping off point, and then I'll okay. I'll toss to Sarah. Okay. You know, the people that you're working with on these and these volunteer roles, and these are you know running you know running events for your kids' schools, right? participating in maybe your community center or if you're part of a church group mm -hmm. and running, you know, running programs that have hundreds and sometimes thousands of people running through them, overseeing budgets of sometimes millions of dollars doing right. fundraising. Oh. These are all very, very transferable skills. And so when, um, especially if you've been out for a little while, you can say, yes, I've been working as a professional fundraiser. Mm -hmm. I've been working as an event manager. I've been, you know, you, you need to do a little bit of work um, in translating those roles. But the first people you should talk to about that are the people that you're volunteering with. Many organizations have a very potent um, board of directors. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing that work, the, these, that board of directors, they know what you can do. And you go in and say to them, hi, as you know, I've been running your yearly multimillion dollar um, fundraising campaign. I'm looking to get back to paid work. I'd like to build on this experience. I'd love to talk with you about people that you know or experiences that you have in translating this to professional work. And that's that's the first place that I recommend to people that they go. Sarah, what do you have to add to this? Um, uh, similar along those lines. I'm very yeah. passionate about this. <laughs> Great. Um, I think that for many women, the key to building their network is a lot of times their personal network. And when I say personal, I mean, you know, your kids' school, your neighbors, you know, all of that. Um, but what's missing is a lot of times you're not furthering that conversation in the right direction. So you are saying, you know, talking about the kids, talking about what's happening in the right. city, right. the town, right. but just taking one step further and deliberately saying, and you'll feel comfortable doing this because you've practiced. Right. But, right. Hey, I don't know if you knew this, but I was in this industry prior. It's been about five years. I'm looking to get back to work. These are the areas I'm interested in. You wouldn't happen to know an industry association I should be involved with, a person I should talk to. I have some questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's it. And they say, you know, I don't, but they know now what you are interested in, what you're doing. You that can't succeed, right? Can't yes. Succeed. Yeah. And we talk about this again a lot in our book, but that can go a long way. And wow. practice having those conversations, mm -hmm. and it gets so much easier and very natural too. Right. Uh, thank you so much for bringing that up because I love that aspect of the book. I think you talked about just you know when someone asks you how you're doing, instead right. of just saying fine, how are you? How are your kids? Tell them what you're doing. Right. <laughs> and I just. Yeah. I really love that. And this individual also shared, she was recalling a time at a soccer game. She yes. watched two individuals, right, interact, and that led to a job. And so yep. thank you for sharing that. I forgot that part. Um, now, I finally have um, sparsed out our question here um, with Jean, and this is such a good one. Thank you so much, Jean, for chiming in on this. She was asking about how do you give advice on staying positive, right? It doesn't matter, by the way, who is in a job search. It's very, the process in and of itself is meant to be a little demoralizing. Yes. <laughs> you're asking for something, someone's saying no. So, right. because you're not, you know, qualified enough or whatever this, but right. what's some, you know, thoughts around that, that how to, you know, stay engaged 
to stay right. positive and, and to keep up the confidence. Uh, um, that's a really great point, Jean. Thanks for prompting that. I, you know, I would say that for me, um, and I know Sarah will have um, a, an additional view on this. I tend to be very systematic about things. And so if you are being systematic and you are, you know, proactively reaching out and reactively responding mm. um, promptly, take, you've got to take the long view and believe that, yes, I am going to end up getting a job and this is how I do it. But when you're in the guts of that process, and maybe you've heard a few no's, um, one thing uh, that I actually had a colleague say to me the other day was, you have to look for the small wins, mm. right? And remind yourself, well, they said no to me, but I got the interview. Mm -hmm. that I had a converse, I had an informal informational conversation with, you know, a, the person that I would really love to have their job. And they don't really think I have the skills yet to do that job. And now I know what it is I need to do next, right? You have to look at that and say, all right. And, and sometimes they're small wins. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But you have to look for those small wins. Um, one thing that um, I was just reading about this. One thing um, that uh, HR people are reporting on is that a whopping 40% of new hires do not work out within the first year. I, and that, yeah. yeah. And so not to engage in schadenfreude, but if you, if you don't get it the first time around, you also want to stay in touch because a lot of times people will come back and say, hey, I know we talked. It didn't work out then. Now we have something new. Sarah, what do you have to add to this? Yeah, having a process is important. It's something yep. to fall back on. Um, but the other piece to this is who are you surrounding yourself with? So I mentioned early on about networking and about types of people to network. We in this book, we in our book, we outline um, who you should be targeting. And one of these is a champ, the champions. Champion with champions. Now, most of the time, these are going to be maybe friends, um, past colleagues, people that know your skills, potentially family, but sometimes the people closest to you aren't going to be those champions. Maybe they aren't agreeing with what you're doing. You know, reasons don't matter, but make sure that you have a, some people call it your board of directors, your personal board of directors, right. whoever that is, identify people within your network, your connections, that ecosystem that will, that you can pick up the phone and call when you're having a bad day, that you can get advice from, um, that you respect, you know, what they have to say and they respect your skills and they know you. And, you know, that I think for me is the, is the key ingredient of keeping the confidence and the positivity up during this time, because it is, you're right. It's very hard. It's a roller coaster and not to say that it won't be, you know, hard and feel insurmountable at times, but surround yourself with those people to help bring you back up again. I love that. And I know, I think I shared with you, I love the term. I've heard board of advisors many times. It's a great one and team of champions, you know, like yes. making it fun. I, I really, I like those reminders. They're so great. Um, one other, I would just add one thing to this. Cause I, I, you know, as, as I was thinking about it, it's really isn't, Every single interaction, if you try to think about it and make it less emotional, sometimes I like adding logic. I work with a lot of engineers too. I think some of you, you've worked with ex-engineers. Mm -hmm. Like we're gathering data. That's right. Can we pull any trends or themes to be curious about or to reframe? It's like the idea of growth mindset sometimes or what went really well. You know, you made it to the final round. That's right. great data. Something we're doing. Yeah. So I, I think that's a really great one. Um, one pivot, which I think is important, and it's sitting in our Q&A box, we need to talk about age. Yes, right? we do. Yep. So let's just pull that band-aid off. Um, I don't know who wants to start on the age piece, because there's certainly years, or when you say you're gone for 18, you know, 15 years, sure. like assumptions there, but but let's talk through how that impacts your, you know, advice, the process, et cetera. You bet. I'll start with this. Um, uh Yes, as you get older, it becomes more difficult um, because I don't want to lie to anybody and tell you, oh no, it doesn't matter. It does, particularly in technology, you are old after 45, mm -hmm. which, and in startup world, it's 35. Yes. So, you know, that's really humbling. 
Yes. Um, particularly for people who have launched, you know, like myself, major businesses and then have come back and somebody saying, well, you are, you know, you are passe now. Mm -hmm. um, the, this is where using your, your community and your, and your network of connections is extra important because these are people who know you and they know what you can do mm -hmm. and they will see your age as an advantage rather than as, as something that, oh, well, that's my DEI for the year, right? right. Um, yeah. So that, particularly if you are worried about age, that's when you wanna absolutely reach to your former managers, reach to your former peers, tell them what it is you're looking to do. Um, and then I do think um, making sure that you engage with energy and to make sure that you are aware of what's going on Mm -hmm. in the industry, checking out a few industry association websites. Um, when we can do this again, going to a couple of industry association meetings, making sure you know what the heck is going on. Yeah. That's going to, that's going to mitigate much of that, but you know, I'm not going to lie to you. It exists, mm -hmm. you know, so that's why using that connection and community is extra important. Huge. Yeah. Anything yeah. else, Sarah, on that one? I would just emphasize um, the relevancy, making sure you are right. perceiving relevant. And there, there's not a lot that you have to do, but you do need to put some effort into it. Make sure you're right. talking in the right language that they're talking in right now. You know, that changes throughout the years. It's um, job titles were called something different, you know, even five years ago, you know, what are they called now? You know, you want right. to know that stuff. So, and this is also like questions that you have about what's been happening in the last few years and what are some current trends. These are also great questions to ask people in roles that you are interested in yes. and a way to connect with them and network and say, look, I've been out, I'm looking to go back. This is about kind of the role that I'm looking for. I just, I have some questions. If you, you know, 20 minutes of your time, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. um, just want to ask you something, you know, so it's a, it's another way to like, you know, sometimes when we're networking, we're like, well, what do we say? You have questions that you're in your head all the time. Ask those questions to people yeah. That's yeah. How you network and grow your network. Yeah. I love that, Sarah. Cause even just asking who are the thought leaders now? What are the books? Cause realistically as we age, and I certainly feel this way too, I'm not going back to school again. It's, they don't have enough time left, right? right. Like <laughs> there's not, and right. so people sometimes, you know, and I'll work with it, but you, you can do just talking to other people. You can read books. There's other ways to get that relevancy too. Um, and I felt that way actually as I was reading the, through the book. So that's a really great point. Um, I want to highlight where we're at with time um, and, you know, see if there's any other uh, questions from the audience. I know oh, we wow. had a couple things that we wanted to do in, in closing here. I guess my my last, I'll, I'll give everyone a second to gather the thoughts if there's any last minute questions, but um, maybe one last question I think um, that would be interesting, or I personally love to hear from both of you is, you know, what's one thing that we all, and there's a group, a mighty group of us here, right? What, what's one thing we can do as we think about this challenge that so many people face? Gosh, that 46, that number is daunting. You know, when people make a pause to help eliminate the stigma and the uncomfortable element, right, of people right. returning. It, maybe it's as an individual, maybe it's as a hiring manager or, or a company. A any thoughts on that? I have many thoughts on this. <laughs> no, sorry, um, you wrote a book. <laughs> you need another hour. No. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that we can all do. I think that's how I felt after yes. I read the book. Yeah, well, and you know, it's very timely, you know, the president just um, announced um, an aid package, which is focused on childcare, which affords better access and better cost childcare to middle-class families so that they don't have to pay more than 7% of their income. That is a huge game changer. So that's number one. I think at the corporate level, companies, um, and, and we're doing some work here, um, we want to see companies become more career break friendly so that people aren't stigmatized or punished for taking a break. Um, Sarah will talk about this um, more, but 85% of millennials plan to take breaks. Their, their work process is getting right. longer. And so we wanna see more companies doing that. And then from an individual level, mm -hmm. um, be deliberate 
as you are looking at coming back from your break, it's really easy to push it off and say, oh, well, it's April and then it'll be summer and then the kids will go back and I'll think about it in the fall. It's the Scarlett O'Hara Tara thing. I'll think about it in the morning. No, think about it now. Yeah. Okay. That's great advice. I love that. Yeah. Um, anything else, Sarah? Uh, like I said, I could talk about this career break. And this <laughs> yeah. Is a passion. Right. You know, right. but, you know, that's, it's really what it's around. You know, we're yeah. advocating on the, on a corporate level of saying people are going to take breaks. It's yeah. okay. If they do make things easier for women to work though, if that's what right. they choose, right. but Right. It's okay if they want to choose to take a break, you know, like right. you don't want to go all the way, you know, back to the other end of the spectrum as well. So, but, but when they take their break, make it easier for them to come back, right? right? right. Give them a lifeline, you know, because a lot of what is hard is you can't find them, right? They can't be found because right. they're not active on LinkedIn. You know, the softwares are booting them out potentially, like they're, they don't know how to play the job search game. You know, yeah. that's what like we're, we're teaching these women to play the game. It's a game, you know, it's not about how good or bad you are as a, as an employee. It's how you, how good you play the game. Right. So teach them how to play the game. And then I think going back Elaine to your question about like, if, if you're in a position of, you know, power, I guess, in regards to hiring or recruiting, look in your own networks. Who do you know has taken a break in your professional or personal networks? Ask them, you know, right. ask question of, Hey, you know, if you ever think about going back to work, contact me, right? I'd love to have a conversation and see what I can do to help you. Yeah. And that's, that, right. Yeah, love right. that advice. I that would be a game changer. Yeah. yeah. I totally agree. Thank you. I just, I know people want to help. So last, last question, we're going to squeeze this one in because it's a really good one. If someone in your network has recommended you or maybe even referred you probably, but you didn't get the job, can you re-engage them? Oh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Okay. Even if it's just to have people move around all the time. Most people move, what, every two to three years, Elaine, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. even internally, absolutely. Even internally, right? So you, if, they, if you, they interviewed you, you didn't get the gig, they were interested enough in you to bring you in, right? They weren't bringing you in to be nice to you. Yeah. Um, so absolutely stay in touch and hit them up once a quarter and say, Hey, just checking in. How's it going? Hope you're doing well. Here's what I'm looking for, or here's what I'm working on, on a contract. Just keep that relationship rolling. Okay. It's just about timing. It's yep. not hundred percent. Usually not you. It just wasn't the right time for the job for whatever it may be. And try not to take it personally and move forward, but absolutely. Right. Keep in touch Cause that timing will be there. I think that's a, a great um, kind of segue into our closing because we're running out of time. Yes. And Grace has a message right before we end. But before we switch over to Grace, um, two things. Uh, just thank you both for your message. Oh, thank you. Thank you for writing this book. And, you know, we, I really felt, as I said, inspired to be, um, to be more helpful. And I think other readers, whether they're reading it to find a job or just because they're curious, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great uh, title for anyone, even people just in a job search. I mean, it's a really great book. So thank you so much for taking the time to write, um, to write the book and have you share your message and push this message about um, care and pauses. I think it's so important. Um, last thing, was there anything else that you wanted to do? We had talked about uh, Raffle, right? for yes. one of the books and before, as we transition to Grace, if for folks on the line, they haven't read the book, they don't have the title, if you could pick a number and put it in the chat box between one and 50, let's say, we are gonna send a signed copy um, to you. So just contact us after, okay? Um, yeah, put those numbers in. Grace, did you wanna come back online to help us close up? Yes, thank you. And thank you, Sarah, Nancy, and Elaine for stopping by and sharing your inspiring advice with us. And a huge thank you to our audience today for spending an hour with us and a good book. This event will soon be available on the University Bookstore YouTube channel, so you can go and re-watch it um, because there was so much touched on here that I know that you're going to want to listen to this multiple times. And you can purchase copies of Back to Business through the University Bookstore website. I think the link's in the chat periodically. 
And um, thank you again for joining us. And please check our website, social media, or sign up for all of our emails to hear about other upcoming events in our series with the Microsoft Alumni Network. Have a great night, everybody. And thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you, everyone. We'll contact thank you. you. Um, actually, the number was 10. So, oh, so it looks I'll like you. Yeah. Was it who was it, Lucy? Uh, Monica. Oh, Monica I was the closest at 14. Is that right? Because yeah, we, we had a 13. We had a 13. 13. Lucy Martin. Okay, wonderful. We'll get in touch. She's you have enough time to get in touch with um, get so her close, contact. Monica. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Lucy, you. you can, um, send me at um, Sarah at the swingshift.co. I can get your book to you. I will yes. mail it to you. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. What a great conversation. Thank you again. Uh, Sarah, is that correct? Is that the right email address? Uh, yes, that's correct. Yep. Perfect. Oh yeah. Thanks for putting in there. Good call. <clears throat> and I have a couple minutes too. I'm happy to stay as we transition and people start to log off here. You know, one other thing um, we didn't discuss as much, but some of these uh, that I wanted to ask a little bit about the timing of your training cohorts. Yeah. Has that changed at all in COVID or? It has. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When COVID hit, um, you know, we started doing in-person programming and right. we, I mean, we pivoted hard to online um, right away. So it. we do have um, what we're running is an, an accountability group right now. Okay. And we're on our, I forget, our fourth or fifth. And it's, it's like a mini version of the career catalyst. Yeah. People come through, it's six weeks and we put them in groups where they hold each other accountable. We, we do a session, we talk about a topic, we, you know, give them a, a, a task, if you will, to work on. Mm -hmm. And then they come back, they report on it, we move to the next thing. And, you know, we found the people who are the most successful in using that, you know, use the book to, an, to a right. company. Well, it's, it's a compliment to what the work it, they're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we are, as we, you know, come up for air for, you know, from this last 14 months, we're thinking hard about, well, what does consumer side programming look like? You know, cause we originally were like, oh, well, we'll just do the career catalyst online. And then thought about the prospect of making people sit in a zoom room for three, four hours at a pop. And we said, well, that's not it's reasonable. Hard. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I, I do it <laughs> three yeah. hours. Yeah. Um, and I have one client that's what they like. Um, really? Well, yeah, but it's very challenging, I think, for this type of content. You know, you're yes. hands on. It's exhausting, right, yeah. to update your resume or to do the exercises. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's and they're more they're more effective, honestly, spread out. I agree. Right. Do yeah. you know, talk about the topic. She wanted a little bit, try it a couple of times, test it out with other people, come back, go to the next thing. And it gets right. back to Jean's point. I think that helps keep you positive. It does. Little bites. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Small yeah. wins.